Tanya for the seventh day of Teves is at the beginning of Perek Ches, chapter 8. It's on page 24. The number at the bottom of the page is 32. In the previous chapter, the Altarebbe described the difference, explains the difference between that which is totally dark, Klippa, and that which is Klippas Nega. And the difference is that in the Klippas Nega, even if it comes into klipa, into the darker Klippa, by indulging in it for its own sake, for the satisfaction of the desire of the appetite, where that which was originally Klippas Nega becomes part of the totally dark Klippa, yet it does not become tied or bound to the totally dark Klippa. And therefore, as soon as the person does chuva and goes back to serving God, the food that he ate, or whatever it was that he indulged in, the permissible relationship, which was done for, for the sake of the taiva, of the, of the pleasure, rises and goes back to godliness with the person who does the tshuva. And that's why it's called mutar, untied, because even when it's in touch with the totally dark klippa, it is not tied to the klippa. Whereas that which is totally dark klippa is called usr, because it is bound to the unholiness, its energy, its life comes from a totally unholy place, and therefore, even if you do tshuva, it doesn't help. Unless you do the kind of tshuva that comes me'ava rabba, from a great love, and then the mitzvah, the sin, becomes a mitzvah, and in that way, that which was unholy, evil, becomes holy. Now, Perikhes. Another thing about the prohibited foods. Which is why they would be called Isur, Osur, tied to unholiness. The first thing that the Rebbe had said in the past, in the previous chapter was that when you do tshuva, after having sinned, the sin doesn't come with you, doesn't return with you to holiness but remains stuck in the unholiness. Another thing is because a person who ate an unkosher food, not knowingly, in the in the in Zayin, the Altarebbe spoke about a person who sins, sins knowingly, zdeinis, he did it intentionally. And he's saying that you can't bring it back through a normal tshuva. You have to have the unusual, the extreme level of avarabba tshuva. Here the Alter Rebbe says that another reason that it is called osr, another way in which it is tied to klipa, is that if a person eats it unintentionally, and he didn't even have a reason, al pihalocha, he had no reason to suspect that it wasn't kosher. So it wasn't even like he was taking a chance. He had no reason to suspect that it wasn't kosher. And not only did he eat it innocently, without knowing that it is prohibited, but in addition, he did it l'shem shamayim. He was eating the food not because of his pleasure, not, not, not to satisfy his appetite. He was eating it l'shem shamayim. Laved Hashem b'keach achilo hahi, to serve God with the strength that he would get from that food. And not only was it an intention that he intended to, to, to use that energy, but he actually does. The Gampo Alva also came. He actually goes ahead and he uses that energy to serve God. The code of the Hispalo, the Keach and he studied or he davened with the strength that he received from that from that food. Even so, Ein Hachayishabo Elo Misla Beshes Betevis Atera Vatvilo Kemeha Hete. Even so, he did it innocently. He did it with Shem Shamayim, and then he actually fulfilled his intention. And, and studied and, and served God with that energy, yet the energy does not rise and does not clothe itself in the words of the Torah or the Tefillah that the person does, as would be the case with, per, with food that is permissible. So we said earlier that there are times when Klipas Neiga rises to become part of holiness, and that is when you use it L'Shem Shamayim. But when it comes to that which is not Klipas Neiga, it is from the totally dark Klipa, then even if you use it, Lishem Shamayim, it does not become part of holiness. 
mipnei yisuda because it is bound bidei hasitra achra in the hands of the sitra achra misholish klipes hatmeyes from the totally dark klipa. Vafilu hu yisudir abonon and even if the prohibition is a rabbinic prohibition, the food is prohibited by the sages. There too, the food cannot serve a godly purpose because it is bound to unholiness. Because the the instructions or the prohibitions of the rabbis are in 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 some ways more stringent than the prohibitions of the Torah itself. The idea here is this: when we're talking about the food being being unholy, being usur, we're saying that not only is there some kind of a prohibition on a person that says, because you are Jewish, you may not eat this food, but that when something is prohibited, there is something about the food itself that is evil. Its energy is an unholy energy. Its life comes from an unholy place. Its whole being is the being of unholiness, of evil. So a person is not allowed to eat it, that's a prohibition and a restriction placed on the person. But a person is not allowed to eat it because it is unholy. There's something wrong with it. When we say that a rabbinic commandment prohibits a person from eating a certain food or having certain relationships or whatever, we mean to say that as a result of the rabbinic prohibition, not only is the person restrained from having that food, but that the food itself has become totally unholy. Even if earlier, before the rabbinic prohibition, the Torah had permitted this food or had permitted this act, meaning that it was from Klippas Neiga. It was permissible. The rabbis came along and they make it prohibited. Something changes in the object of itself, that it, it itself becomes an unholy and sinful being. So that's why the Alti Rebbe says, Chamurim divrei seifim, yesim divrei teira, that when the rabbis prohibit something, it becomes even more unholy, more prohibited than the words of Torah. And that is the authority that the rabbis have to even change the nature of a thing, which by nature the Torah created it God created it, Torah created it in the state of Klippas Nega and it was permissible but the rabbis have the authority to turn it into a totally unholy thing because the, the, the Rabbonon are the, are the authorities and have the authority to change nature as they find fit V'lochein gam that's why the Yetzirah itself, and the and the desire that desires things that are prohibited, who shed mishedin nuchroyin, shahu Yetzirah shall umesayilam. Having come to this point, the Alter Rebbe says, now we can understand how the Yetzirah for that which is prohibited is itself an unnatural thing for a Jew. A desire for that which is prohibited is unnatural for a Jew because the Jewish animal soul, the nefesh abahamis, is different from the soul of the non-Jew. Beside the fact that a Jew has a godly soul and a non-Jew has only one soul, the one soul that the non-Jew has is not the same as the animal soul of the Jew. The animal soul of the Jew is from Klippas Neiga, whereas the soul of the non-Jew comes from the totally dark Klippa. And that's why by the Jew, even by virtue of his animal soul, there are some good traits, like compassion, whereas in the soul of the non-Jew, there is no compassion there by nature. It is acquired. It's learned. But it is not by nature of the soul. Therefore, those things that come from the totally dark klipa, like the animals that aren't kosher, plants that aren't kosher, relationships that aren't kosher, anything that is prohibited, 
it means that it is of the three, the totally dark klipa. It is therefore unnatural for the animal soul of a Jew, which comes from klipas nega. It is unnatural for the animal soul to desire that which comes from the other klipa. It's out of its field. And that's why the Zaya says that there are shadim, demons, referring to the Yetzirah. There are demons that are foreign demons, and there are demons that are Jewish demons. In other words, there's Jewish Yetzirah and there's non-Jewish Yetzirah. A Jewish Yetzirah is the desire to indulge, which is Yetzirah, to indulge in things that are permissible. Because the animal soul of Klipas Nega desires that which comes from Klipas Nega. And that's the permissible. Only being a Yetzirah, what it desires is the selfish fulfillment of its own appetite. Using that which comes from Klipas Nega. But for the animal soul of a Jew to desire that which is prohibited means that it is desiring something that comes from a totally different Klipa. That's unnatural. And that's why it's called a non-Jewish klipa, a non-Jewish demon. It is the Yetzirah of the non-Jew. Because the soul of the non-Jew is of the totally dark klipa, therefore it desires those things that are also of totally dark klipa. Shanaf, she say hem, their souls, the souls of the non-Jews, are meshalish klipa satmeyes, and therefore they desire things that are also of shalish klipa satmeyes. On the other hand, the desire for those things that are permissible, but but not for a heavenly purpose, only to to satisfy one's own desire and appetite. Who shed in you who This is a demon from the Jewish demons. Because it. <clears throat> that which the person indulges in, that is from Klipas Neiga, the permissible, it can rise, it can return with the person to holiness, and therefore it is in the same state as the person himself. The animal soul of the Jew can sin by indulging in the permissible, but as soon as he returns to godliness, the, the indulgence returns with him, and the object of his re- indulgence returns with him. And therefore, the, the nefesh, the animal soul, and the permissible food are of the same substance and in the same condition, and therefore it is called a Jewish demon. We have to explain over here. If it's true that the desire for those things that are prohibited is not a Jewish desire, it's not a Jewish Yetzirah, how is it that we see that there are Jews who have a desire for things that are prohibited? So how does a Jewish Yetzirah come to these non-Jewish desires? So the Rebbe already answered it earlier when the Alter Rebbe says that when you indulge in the permissible, it temporarily brings it down to the level of the totally dark clip. So it starts off with a Jew having Jewish Yetzirahs. He wants to indulge in a little kosher food, in a little kosher pleasure, in a little kosher. But from the indulgence, he temporarily falls to the level of the totally dark klipa. And at, at some point, the totally dark klipa begin to become an attraction for him as well. Because he's dabbled in it through the Jewish Yetzirahs. So when he exposes himself in that way to the klipa that is really not supposed to be part of his life at all, he opens himself up and he becomes vulnerable to where he starts desiring things that have nothing to do with his world and don't belong in his world. And that's why it says that a person should be extremely careful with not indulging in the permissible. He should take ten measures of care to not indulge in the permissible so that he not get involved or get caught up in one measure of the prohibited. Because by indulging in the permissible, it take, he's taking himself into the world of a totally dark klipa, and eventually it can become an attraction, e- even though it is an unnatural one. 
Now the Al-Tabah goes on to say <clears throat> that there is a lingering effect even though when a person eats what is permissible for unholy purposes, it can be redeemed. And as soon as the person does tshuva, that energy, that food, also is brought back to holiness. Ach mikol yet, in spite of this, keidem shechaza l'gdusha, until the person returns to holiness, until he does his tshuva, hu sitra achra l'klipa. The food that he ate, although it was originally permissible, but because he indulged in it for the sake of the, of the appetite of the pleasure, it is klipa, the gamacha kach, and that's why even after he does his tshuva, harishimu mimenu nishar dovuk beguf. Some trace of it remains attached to the body. Some trace of the totally dark klipa. Why does some of it stick? Why doesn't Shiva help? Because as soon as the person ate the food, it immediately became part of his flesh and blood. Because even before the food is digested and thoroughly ingested, as soon as the person takes pleasure in the food, that food becomes part of his flesh and blood. And that's why the body needs to be cleansed in the in the purgatory of the grave. In other words, the suffering of the grave, to cleanse him and to purify him from this uncleanliness, which he received when he took pleasure in the pleasures of this world. In other words, although he does tshuva, the tshuva takes him away from a place of unholiness and puts him back into a place of holiness from now and onwards. But not retroactively. It doesn't make the pleasure that he had into something kosher. So at the moment that he was eating the food, he was indulging in that, in that which was, at least temporarily, totally dark klipa. And that became his flesh and blood. So in the body, there is always a trace of that unholiness that is left. And that's why the body goes through the experience of the grave in order to be purified from the slightest pleasure that a person had in this world. Which comes, mitumas klipas neiga v'shedin yehudoyin, which comes from the tuma of klipas neiga and permissible or Jewish Yetzirah, Jewish demons, which even even the Klippas Nega has to be cleaned away, has to be uh, removed from the body. There is the exception, the individual who doesn't have to go through the experience of the grave, like Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi HaKadosh, the author of the Mishnah, of whom it is said that all the days of his life, even as a child, he never took pleasure in worldly things. He never enjoyed the physical world for its own sake. It was always for the sake of heaven. In the Hayyim Yain for the seventh day of Teves, the Rebbe writes, that to avert Chibut HaKeva, the purgatory of the grave, you should recite words of Torah, Tehillim, or, or Tanya, for one-sixth of the day. To spend the sixth of the day saying words of Torah, of the written Torah. To merit purity of the soul that removes the need for Kaf HaKeva, which is another form of purification that the soul goes through after death in order to avoid that you spend as much of the day as possible saying Mishnah, Tanya and Tilim by heart